Welcome to Shop Talk Live, episode number 201. Today, it is Mike and I, just the two of us, the little duo show, and we discuss first-hand planes to buy, where to incorporate frame and panels in a wall-hanging tool cabinet, the best way of getting wide rifts on oak stock, and English-style table saw fences. But first, we have a quick word from our sponsor. When you're in the middle of a long sanding session, inevitably, you're going to start to think, I wonder if this sanding disc is old and used up. And I found that the best time to switch to a new sanding disc is the moment you think about it. Every second after that is wasted time. Maverick Abrasives is a family-run manufacturer of all things abrasives, such as sanding belts and sanding discs. Their manufacturing facility is located in Anaheim, California, where knowledgeable experts are on call Monday through Friday to answer any sanding or finishing questions you have. Head on over to maverickabrasives.com and check out their wide assortment of sanding discs. They've got you covered with the best prices on the web, whether you use 5-hole, 8-hole, or festool-hole pattern discs. To top it off, they have free shipping on orders of $200 or more. So join fellow Mavericks Ramon Valdez and Philip Morley and stock up at maverickabrasives.com today. Hey, Mike. Hey, Ben. What's up, man? <laughs> so I want to thank you for using quarter sawn cherry on your crosscut sleds. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so when I bought the table saw from you, yeah, they came with a, a plethora of sleds. Oh, no. <laughs> there was like four. And I was kind of tripping over them. Yes. So I kind of took them all apart. Wow. All but one. Okay. I used one. Okay. And... uh Thank you for not gluing the sleds <laughs> or the, the the front and back. Uh, All right. I see where this is going. Into place. And, um, man, there's, there's been a lot of nice test stock and scrap huh. in those old sleds. But last night, I decided to remake a neck for a ukulele. And um, I needed a piece of quarter sawn cherry. And lo and behold... There it was. There it was. Wow. Okay. So one of your crosscut sleds is turning into a ukulele neck. Wow. How's, how about that? That just is a good lesson for every scrap of wood out there. Hey, you know, <laughs> there might be something in you yet. As long as you're not in the, you know, in, you can be in the burn pile. As long oh, as you're it was not, in the burn pile. As long as you're not in the wood stove. Yeah. There's a chance you can be a ukulele neck. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. I thought that was, I was, I was like. Really psyched about that. Cool. Yeah. It probably uh, killed me to use that piece of cherry for a crosscut sled. But, you know, you got this eight-quarter stuff. It's like, oh, that's thick enough. I'll just mill it up. So I'm good. All of your sleds were pretty, I mean, really impressive stock huh. for the fences. Would, would we call those fences? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, all eight-quarter stock. Okay. Some white oak. Yeah. Some cherry. Yeah. No pine, no like MDF, no, you don't mess around. I don't. Well, you start with eight quarter stock and, you know, you get all your parts and you're left with this two foot length of eight inch white, eight quarter stock. And it just looks, oh, this is going to be something. And it's not. Yeah. Or you get like a, like a yeah, line of it, sap, it's... you're ripping some sap off an edge, but you can't get rid of this thing. This is like four inches wide by two inches thick by 30 inches long. I can't throw that away. Sled. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Well, and actually, I used one of the fences. Uh, I cut it in half to use as a test piece because I, I had some wonkiness going on. And I needed to figure something out. Yeah. And um, it was funny. I was actually doing an Instagram story because it just everything went together perfectly. I had this test piece, and and it was, it was a piece of cherry that had a big piece of sap. Okay. Sap wood right there. And as I held it up to the camera, I'm like talking, I'm like, oh, look, and it fits perfect. I was like, that looks really great. Crap, why did I cut that off? You know, it was, it was like, this would have been, this would have been a really interesting looking neck. And I'm generally now, I, I do get rid of sap right. most of the time. Right. But like on the back of an instrument, yeah. a little pow. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so, yeah, it's a, it's a duo show. We've got some questions that were suited for Mike, and everybody's out of town. This is a hard time to get pods together. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why. 
Everybody, well, I mean, it's busy, yeah. uh, hands on. That was fun. That was fun. We were in San Diego for a long weekend. That, I was there for a week. Oh, yeah, that's right. You're doing other fun stuff. You did Craig Thibodeau, Patrick Edwards, uh, Russ Felbeck. Wow. Yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a really, really great week. Yeah. And hands on San Diego was incredible. Palomar yeah. was yeah. insane. The school was great. People were great. The weather was great. The food was great. Yeah. And I moved away from there <laughs> and I could never move back again. And we had three inches of rain last night. <laughs> yes. oh. Although the entire time I was really, I was thrown off by their, their, and it took me a few days to figure it out. I just look up at the sky and I'd be like, why is that wrong? What's wrong with this? And all of a sudden it was like, there's no clouds. <laughs> there's no, it's just blue. And it really like, yeah. I, I had a hard time with yeah. that. So I've been driving around. Fall is nice. Fall is nice. Fall is <laughs> yeah. really nice. Fall is nice. San Diego's nice while too. I'm, <laughs> while I'm crying. <laughs> uh, oh, well. Yeah. Um, all right. So question number one is from James. I've been woodworking for several years, but I, I'm just now beginning to incorporate hand tools into my work. I mainly used reclaimed antique longleaf pine. Running it through my jointer and planer, then I use a belt sander and r random orbit sander to get it to get a finished surface. I'd like to eliminate some of the sanding and use a hand plane. Can I go from the planer straight to a smooth smoothing plane, or should I use something larger first, like a seven or eight? I don't currently own any hand planes, so any advice on what to buy would help. Yeah, I mean the jointer and planer that is doing what your long planes are doing for you. Yeah, and so you could even get by with just a smoothing plane, um, and you're going to knock off the snipe and get rid of any tear out or you know uh, machine marks or anything like that. So that's fine. Um, yeah, don't don't double duty. Uh, obviously, you want to skip the sanding altogether. You never want to hand plane a surface that's already been sanded because you're just going to beat up your plane iron super quick. Is that true in closed pour woods? It's true. In everything? It's just true. Okay. Yeah. That's, there may be an exception, but let's not say there is because I i don't know. I've never, I scrape after I sand. So I hand plane, then sand, and then if there's tear out marks, then you can scrape. But the scraper is sort of treated as a sacrificial tool, you know, it's going to get beat up, but you got four edges. You can bring yeah. those back pretty quick. They're um, cheap, so you yeah. buy two or three. <laughs> yeah. Um, first plane. Um, that's a good question. It depends. If you don't have the money for a really good smoother, which I think ultimately you want, um, rather than start with a lower price, say number four, that you're eventually maybe going to want to replace, start with the number five. Because that can work as a smoother, but you're probably going to want a five and a four. That's what, I mean, those are my two go-to planes. Mm -hmm. And like, for instance, I can get by with an, an old Stanley Bailey number five. I have a bedrock, which is basically the same thing with a hawk iron in it. And that gets you like 96% of what, say, a Lee Nielsen plane will get you. That extra 4% is pretty important, but you can live without that for a while. So I would get a, a good, decent quality number five. And then later on, you know, if you're really into it and you really want to sink some money into a smoother, which is just going to take you to that final mirror surface, I would do that. But let's say, let's say you're willing to invest right off the bat. Yeah. Would you still get a, a number five? Um. I, you know, so many people out there, even Lee Nielsen recommends get a bevel up, what smoother a jack. I think they say that's yeah. that's the go-to, the idea being it's a versatile plane. You can change the bevel angle and get different planes out of it. Um, they just don't fit my hand right because you don't have that frog and that blade. There's just like just air in front of the back tote. So when I'm gripping, I usually it's like leg room, man. I usually extend my pointer finger along the side of a hand plane when I'm planing. Because you're sophisticated. I am. And when those with the low angle planes, there's nothing there. So I'm just gripping that tote with all four fingers and thumb. And it's just it's just weird. And I know a lot of people have it. I'm sure you get used to it, but um so if all of my planes got stolen 
um, and I needed a plane. Yeah, probably the number four bronze Lee Nielsen, smoother. Doesn't have to be bronze, but I would get a number four Lee Nielsen. So I... You know, Veritas makes a great plane, too. I don't know if I mentioned that. Hey, guys, we saw them in San Diego. <laughs> they, no, I think, so my go-to, the, the, just about the only plane I use is my Veritas Bevel Up Jack. Okay. But it's because it's my best plane. Yeah. All of my other planes are meh, not great. Yeah. I have an old number four that's just not the one. Right. Like we've talked about last time or one time with Bob. Um, uh, and I, I have a couple of block planes that, you know, totally different bag. Yeah. You know, um, I use that bevel up jack for everything. I don't know how much I buy into the whole, oh, you can get different blade angles. And because I, I actually have an extra blade. Mm -hmm. I've never used it. Um, I don't know. I've never really needed to. I guess if I was working with some really figured stock, yeah. maybe I'd I'd sharpen it up at forty five degrees yeah. and and go to town. But um, I really really like my bevel up jack for the for my one and only plane. But mm -hmm. that's also because it's my best plane. Right. If I bought a, like a bevel up smoother or a number four size smoother or something before the bevel up jack, that would probably be my go to plane. Interesting. Yeah. So I don't know I don't know if if I would lean towards 4 or 5 size, you know. Mm -hmm. Um I really really and and not just saying it because you said Veritas makes a great <laughs> play too. I really want a Veritas bevel up smoother. That's probably my next plane purchase. Okay. But um I just like their I just like it. Uh but I think just get one really good plane. All right. Yeah. So either bevel up smoother, bevel up, bevel up jack, regular smoother, regular jack. Yeah. Yeah. If you're going to buy one plane, just get get a really, you know. Yeah. And it goes back to if one, you can. one of the, the problems of, okay, I'm buying my first plane is it, it may or may not point to the notion that you need to get this up and running and you may not have experience getting a hand plane up and running. And you can get, like when Chris Gochner does a hand plane review and he reviews planes of all different economic strata, you mm -hmm. know, so, and his, his take is basically, yeah, this X dollar plane is, is much cheaper. And if you're willing to do a little work, you can get it up and running. That's, yeah. that's the answer for the most part. I mean, there are some planes where, I mean, I don't think you want to go out and pay 30 bucks for a brand new smoothing plane, chances are it's never going to get you close to what you want it to do. Um, but when I say like Italy Nielsen or Veritas, it means that right out of the box, you can put an edge on the blade and both of those companies, the backs of the blades are flat enough where you don't have to spend two days flattening a plane iron mm -hmm. in order to be able to get it sharp. Um, so you can get sharp super easily. And once you get your blade sharp, the rest of the plane is tuned up so well that you can just put the blade in, set the set the depth of cut, and start making sure. Yeah, nothing's going to fight you on it. Right. Now, all right, so let's throw a different scenario out there where since he is a professed hand tool virgin. Okay. <laughs> we can say that, whatever. Um, what if for the same money, for the same... 250 we're talking for a nice plane. Okay. What if for the same money, like I know uh, Bob has classes where you go and you tune up a plane. Yeah. For probably about that much. Um, Andrew Hunter does a class where it's like you go and you tune up a Japanese hand plane for about that much. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of like Woodcrafts and Rocklers probably have – tune up an old Stanley plane classes. Mm. Yeah. The thing that I like about that notion is that you're going to be going in there with someone who knows sharp and who knows 
how to get the plane sure. going. Yeah. And at the end of the week or the end of the weekend or the end of the day, you're going to be taking shavings. Yeah. W- with the guidance of someone who hopefully knows what they're doing. Right. That might be the worth the price of admission right there. Yeah. I think that's good. Um, what you said about tuning up an old Stanley. Um, you can't tune up just any old Stanley. You know, yeah. it's got to be in good enough condition. And if that's not something you're sort of, you know, in tune with with trying to, you know, decide on what to buy, yeah, Bob should run a class where – because Bob, like, cannot help himself like a lot of us from buying old Stanley number fours. And he has, like, milk crates full of them. Yeah. So, Bob, you need to offer a class. He does. Does it? Where yeah. you start, like he provides yeah, like you he with has a beat up Stanley? Of number fours. Oh. And you like go and you're like, oh, I'm going to grab this one. And then you do all the stuff. That's a good class. You want to take that class now, well, don't you? I kind of do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's the, that's the ideal. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. That would be, that would be a, a fun thing. Yeah. And Andrew Hunter has a class. Like, this blows my mind. He has a class that you you set up. Yeah. A Japanese smoothing plane. Eh. And you know whose idea that was? That was my idea. Was it? Yeah. All right. Um, I bet you it was Andrew Hunter's idea. Andrew Hunter, <laughs> <laughs> he did a weekend uh, class on Japanese hand planes. Yeah. And I suggested, hey, why don't you have everyone go home with a Japanese hand plane so you know how to sharpen it, tune it up, and then you know how to use it. Because I really want to take that class because I <laughs> I want to get into Japanese hand planes. So that was like purely selfish reasons. And I haven't had a chance to take that yet. But that is, oh, shoot, I don't know when we go on the air. It's coming up. It might have already be gone by the time this goes on the air. Uh, I'll have to look. My Wi-Fi is really so, sketchy right but now. Check on check the calendar for Connecticut Valley School of Woodworking because Andrew has run that um, a time or two in the past as well. So yeah. if that's what you're interested in, I would take a look at that. I don't know. See, we're doing we're we're earning our free red pencils today. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> that's a good question. Do I want my very first hand plane to be a Japanese plane? I don't know. I'm not saying they're not great because oh. I'm sure they're like stunning. But is that learning curve a little steep because, oh, well, like where we're at in Connecticut with the seasons, that wooden sole is going to move. You sort of have to tune it up and it's not dead flat. You have strategic concaves, so you have certain bearing points. And then the blade is like – to listen to Andrew Hunter talk about sharpening is just like – We're going to have Andrew insane. in soon. Yes. We're going to have him in on, on the pod soon. Yeah. And – um, I like. I always feel like I would love to get into Japanese hand planes, but I'm not into tools enough. Yeah. Or I'm not into process enough. I just want to get the thing done. Yeah. And for me, like that's why it's like, oh, that plane right there I, that I have on the shelf. Right. Um, yeah. So. All right. Let's uh, let's go to question number two. From Tommy, I would like to build Mike's famous hanging tool chest, but with frame and panel construction. I think it's awesome as is, but frame and panel construction with plywood panels seems to be more in my budget. How can I securely join the panels together for such a heavy piece in my small, mostly hand tool shop? Well, Tommy. Hmm. Um, So frame and panel, I'm guessing you mean as opposed to the solid sides. Because the doors so are already frame and panel with, this with plywood panels. So I'm guessing yeah. that because I had solid case sides, dovetail in the corners, through tenons for a fixed shelf. They're not that – that's not that deep. I don't think that case portion – I don't think it's more than 10 inches deep minus the doors. So which would be a little bit narrow for me to go through the the hassle of making frame and panel sides with plywood panels. Just make it a three-quarter ply. The whole thing, the whole the depth of the whole case, yeah, is thirteen and seven eighths, including the doors. Yeah, so the main case is ten inches. Yeah, doors are three inches. Yeah. Oh, and the frame and panel would be seven eighths. Oh, okay, there you go. Yeah, just go three quarter ply. You'll be okay. Yeah, I don't think there's any shame in that one. Nope, not at all. In fact, um, when Bob actually taught 
I think he taught a version of my wall cabinet. And they made it out of plywood. They may have used finger joints, or they may have just, like, I don't think he did biscuits and screws, but they did something down and dirty with it. Um, I mean, even, you know, biscuits is going to hold that thing together just fine. Yeah. I think it... I don't know about biscuits with a hanging wall cabinet. Well, That's I would a have, lot of weight. Well, I would have the sides go... Um, full height so that the biscuits yeah. are going horizontal, you know, so, you know, they're in shear as opposed to pulling apart, you know, if the, the top and bottom were biscuited vertically. And also you have this big, heavy, I think it's a half inch plywood panel glued and screwed into rabbits in the case and you're hanging it from that. That is really, I think, the major support of the entire okay, case yeah. um, as opposed to you know, because I think everything is sort of attached to the back or there's a fixed shelf and with a ramp. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of weight, but I don't think like, for instance, a dovetail case is super necessary. Yeah. And the more I think about it, there's a lot of kitchen cabinets put together with biscuits. Yeah. And a lot of dishes and bowls and inside yeah. those kitchen cabinets. It's not like. Yeah. Yeah, all right. And it's a tool cabinet. And if it's on the wall, I always keep in mind, okay, if it's if if it's on the wall and the top of the cabinet is above eye level and the bottom is below eye level, it means you're never seeing the top and the bottom. So if I just have this kind of plywood butt joint or something visible on the top or bottom of the case, I don't care because I'm oh, never yeah, going to see it. Oh, yeah, that's a really it. good point. Yeah. You're never going to see that. Yeah. Y you could even, oh, God forbid, pocket screw it and you're never going to see it. Yeah. Um, conversely, it's a good chance to try out some dovetails. Just like bang them out if they're ugly, no big deal. They're still going to be super strong. In plywood? No, it's regular stock. Because like 10 inches, you can just, you know, I don't think that it's cost prohibitive to make that out of solid stock. But um, you, now, could do, you could do finger joints in plywood. That would be like bomb proof. Finger joints in plywood, it's just, especially now, all right, now we're getting like birch back ply. into, well, if you use Baltic birch. That's, yeah, that's sweet. But now we're up to a hundred bucks a sheet. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, but you get a whole thing out of that. Yeah. Yeah. I love Baltic birch. And you're going to spend probably more than a hundred bucks in solid stock if you're making it. Out yeah. Of that, so. But if you, you know, home center ply. Yeah. You probably get it for, well, you're talking 70, 80 bucks. How do you feel about uh, edge banding? That's fine. Um, I would probably go like solid stock. I've done the iron on stuff. Yeah. It's no big deal. I've also done, you know, like, you know, quarter inch, eighth to quarter inch thick solid stock, you know, glue that on there and, and true it up. That's no big deal. If you want to get rid of that plywood edge. Yeah. All right. So let's see. Uh, but yeah, if there was any doubt, the, your, the actual uh, cabinet is plywood frame and panel. On the doors, right? The door panels yeah. are, yes. Yeah. So. Just that, if I believe he's that, talking about the door panels, it's already yeah. plywood. So I think that's half inch plywood panels. And I think it's rabbited so that the panels are flush to the inside. Yeah. Um, so it makes it a really clean surface for, you know, hanging a bunch of tools from those inside faces. And you, and you made yours out of beach, right? Beach, yep. And then actually I do have like sort of internal doors and that's just half inch perch ply. Yeah. That's no big deal. How's beach to work? I've never worked done anything with beach. It's kinda heavy. It's kinda hard. It was kinda wasn't as great as I thought it would be. Oh really? Yeah. I'm not sure I'd do it again. Super heavy. Where would you do it from now? Uh ash. Yeah. Super cheap. Soft oh. maple? I hate maple. You hate maple? I don't hate maple. Mike. I don't know. It's just, I don't hate maple, but just the closed grain nature of it. It like collects dust in a shop environment. Like maple is about the luster and the finish and the depth. And to me, that runs counter to shop stuff. It's like if you have this nice kind of tiger maple in the shop, I think that's like wasted. Like I don't, 
I wouldn't put. It's cool when I see it. That's fine if you want to do it. This is great. I have uh, my tool rack is Tiger Maple. Mike. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't do like moldings and inlay and stringing and marquetry on my shop stuff because it's always dusty. And when I see dust on it, it really bothers me because it's like supposed to be super nice. So I guess something like ash, which is more open grain, oak, it just is kind of like, yeah, it's just a tool. It's just, it's in my shop. See, the open there. grain nature of ash is one thing that, like, I don't think I would use it for a workbench. Although I always say I would do a workbench out of ash, but I would do it knowing that it's going to start looking dingy quickly. Huh. Whereas I feel like maple, you can clean it off easier. You can, you know, there's, yeah. there's, there's not the, the gunk setting in the pores. I guess my workbench is made out of maple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fine. All right. It's all good. Yes. What would you make a workbench out of now? Because you're you're thinking about doing a workbench, right? Yeah. Um. I don't know. Either white oak or maple base. The top, huh? Why maple? After what? all you just said. What did I say? You hate maple. Yeah, I said white oak or ash. I'm sorry for oh, the base. Okay. All right. You said white oak or maple. Yeah, right. maple moves a lot. If you have a maple top, it moves. Yeah. It's not that stable. I don't know. But it is closed grain, so for a bench top, it's pretty good. Nice little light coat of, like, Watco on it in the glue. It just pops off really quick. Mm -hmm. So that's nice. I don't know. I have to think about it. All right. I think I would be open to what was on hand. and Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, it is time for us to discuss our all-time favorite tools of all time for this week. You want to go? No, go ahead. All right. I am going with, even though I don't like them. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is a very shop talk live thing. I don't like them, but I love having my digital calipers. Huh. I use them nonstop now. Not like it's. There is not one time I go out to the shop without pulling out my calipers. Wow. I think Tim Rousseau did it to me. Huh. Does he go with a digital caliper? He doesn't know. He uses um, mostly a metric. Oh, God. <laughs> and and the, that I Stereo knew. dial yeah. caliper. Yeah. Um, so I, I've been meaning to tell you for a while I'm, I'm veering metric. No, you're not. <laughs> Yeah. I'm not exclusively seeing metric, but... Friends don't let friends drive metric. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to work metric in as much as possible because I like... Like if I go, like if I go reference something, I will measure in metric. And so I'm saying... So I can say, all right, that's about 20 millimeters. And it actually like conjures an image in my head. Okay. As opposed to a few months ago, I'd say it's about 20 millimeters. I don't know, that big. Right. I, you know, like right. I have. So I am I'm veering metric and it's wonderful. Okay. Um, but so when we were up at Tim's, he uses dial calipers for a lot of things. Centering stock, doesn't matter how thick the stock is. Just measure it and divide it by two, you know. Um, so my digital calipers go back and forth okay between metric and uh imperial uh-huh um i like that and then i have a dial caliper that is just imperial but it's in hundred, hundreds of an inch and i that it that makes no sense to me yeah um so i think eventually i'm gonna get a dial caliper in metric all right and consider myself metric you brought up a really good point though because people say, oh, metric is so much better. I don't know why you stupid people in the U.S. use inches. That makes no sense. And the main reason is I think in inches. It's like you said. Yeah. I know what 30 and a half inches is. I know what three quarters of an inch is. I know what 12 and seven eighths is. Like I can – yeah, I don't know if you do this. I do this for entertainment. I'll look at a scrap and guess how this long it is and then measure it. <laughs> 
<laughs> do you not do that? <laughs> no, but for entertainment, I used to at parties. <laughs> I used to at parties like go around and be like, hold your fingers up. What's what's uh three and a half inches? And, oh, okay. and somebody go like this big. Oh. I go, no, that's five inches. Oh, so you're shaming people. Yeah. Okay, that's an yeah. extra level. Yeah. 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 I was maybe drunk. <laughs> but yeah, um uh, so that's you, a fun game, Mike. It is. But I mean it's that notion of, hey, if you think in metric, that's what you should use. And uh, like I think in inches, I don't want to rewire my brain. I just don't. Like, for instance, you said, like, for me, that next level and they're compatible for me is going decimal measurements of inches. Like, you know, 0 0.125, 0 0.25, 0 0.125, 0 0.0625, 0 0.375. Like, I know all of that kind of stuff, I guess because I have to. All right. So, all right. So what is point six two five? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> five eighths. Uh. <laughs> It'll be five eighths of an inch, man. Thank you. Um. Yeah, I have more of a difficult time with decimals than I do metric at this point. Yeah, like when I use a dial caliper, it's like in thousands. Yeah. So it's. 67, like one in 67 or, or whatever. That's a worst thing for me about using a dial caliper is that I like perfect. And if I measure like each side of a groove and it's off by like two thousands in my mind, it's like, that's two big tick marks. And like, you make a <laughs> yeah. small adjustment with the fence and then all of a sudden you're off by 15 thousands. It's <laughs> yeah. like, Oh, yeah. so you got to, you don't want to know. You, that's where you really got to say that's good enough. Yeah. And I hate that notion because I like perfect, but dial calipers, you got to say 2,000. Okay, I'm good. I'm going to call that because if you, you know, rip two boards and you measure each, that variance of ripping and the thickness of the stock and the distance between the fence and the stock, if it moves a little bit, yeah, I got to just let that go. Yeah, I and I find, though, that working in metric – a lot of times, or or uh, sorry, not necessarily working with metric. When I am breaking out the calipers, and you do it in metric, yeah, it does. It doesn't have as much weight to it as when you're like, oh, two thousandths of an inch. Yeah, it's like okay, I'm I'm off half a millimeter. Well, I don't really know what that means, so sure. that's fine. Yeah, but two thousandths of an inch sounds like a serious deal. Yeah, so. Yeah. And so all the machinists out there who are just like screaming in their cars or driving, listening to this about how 2000 is like perfectly, perfectly allowable tolerance. It's like, no, it's not for them. No. So wood, strictly speaking, wood. Yes. Then again, all the home building guys out there are screaming at their, at their, <laughs> out loud. <16th>. Too. <laughs> it's like, 2000. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> Yeah, there's no such thing. Like, life stops at a sixteenth of an inch, if that. Yeah. There's nothing more accurate below that number. Well, and but then I also argue that you shouldn't have anything. I Like, I don't want 30 seconds on, on my combo square. Hmm. Because that is, the combo square is, if I'm, if I'm using the rule on the combo square, it is a somewhat macro, I want... One inch, I want half inch, I want whatever. Okay. If I'm measuring something to try and center. Yeah. Or to place a center tick mark, then I want I want actual millimeters or whatever. Oh. I mean, I I do. I like just the 16ths on the combo square of my ruler, but I still treat it very accurately because I can split a 16th visually pretty well. So that's like mm -hmm. yeah. one in five and a half sixteenths or one in a fat 16th or skinny 16th. You know what I mean? It's just like I, I kind of visually kind of can squish numbers out of a bigger thing. Whereas if, yeah, if I have a ruler with 64s, uh, I, it, I go blind looking yeah. at that and trying to see what line it is and then trying to count to see what 64th that is. That means nothing to me. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. What's your all-time favorite tool of all time for this week? Um, 
new baby toolbox I'm making. Um, I baby have toolbox, baby toolbox. Yes, <laughs> I have a. I made a travel chest a while back, um, and that's really good. I mean, basically, whenever I drive, I carry that with me. I've actually ended up teaching that uh, quite often, and it holds a really good essential collection of hand tools. And when I'm on the road, I live out of it. And often in between classes at home, my tools don't leave it and I kind of work out of it in my shop. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm starting to do a lot more flying when I uh, when I travel and that's just too big to take. I've tried a small Japanese toolbox, which is okay. The biggest problem was with the Japanese toolbox, it had little sliding trays and stuff, is that it was hard to access the tools I wanted to access. And to okay. me, I think a tool chest, rather than just holding things for travel, I think its job is to basically act as a workstation for whatever tools um, you want to use. Ideally for me, I shouldn't have to move a tool to get to a tool. Order a first retrieval. Thank you. So... Uh, actually, I my travel chest is at getting a little filled up, so I'm not always exactly there, but it's, it's pretty close. So I wanted a, a smaller chest that I could get to all my tools with in an orderly fashion, um, which meant having to look at my tools and pare them down. So in my regular tool chest, I would have a number five, a bevel up smoother, and a number four. I winnowed that down to just one number four. So I got rid of a couple hand planes, some weight. The other thing is that all my chisels were stored in a drawer, which was fine. You open the drawer and you can access everything really well. But I like the Dutch style tool chest where the chisels are like standing up mm -hmm. at the back. So I had my, my same basic style tool chest, but now I have a little rack in the back and all my chisels stand vertically in the back. So now I counted, I have about 20 tools in sort of the till, this kind of open bin where you open the lid and everything's there. There's a couple drawers down below, but I've got it right now anyway, until I start to add more tools, I have about, you know, what I consider to be an essential kit of tools and I can pull any one out anytime I want without having to move another tool out of the way. So your old tool chest was called the essential tool chest. Yeah. Is this the essential-er tool chest? Uh, I would call this the essential tool chest, and that one is now the essential and preferable tools tool oh, okay. chest. All right, there's that next level. The nice to have tool chest. Yes, yes. Okay. The essential plus extra. <laughs> the yeah. Essential plus. <laughs> we'll see. So I'm I'm actually traveling to the, the, for the first time with my new chest coming up. Uh, going up to Minnesota, um, to say hi to Raleigh Johnson and his buddies at the Central Minnesota Woodworkers Guild. Mm -hmm. I probably got that wrong. But uh, so I'm taking that up there um, and going to be playing around with that for a week while I'm up there. And hopefully that's going to, you know, that's kind of a, its maiden voyage. So we were talking about shipping tools at lunch the other day. Yeah. And I just bought a big suitcase. Oh, did you? I didn't do like you the full on the Pelican. Pelican. Okay. I just got a bigger, like, check-in suitcase as opposed to I, I have sort of a like everybody I have a carry-on suitcase that I end up checking whenever I have tools in there and then I saw these people at the airport and they were rolling around these massive things I was intimidated I didn't get like a big giant one but I did get like a bigger one which is definitely a check-in as opposed to a carry-on yeah. suitcase so the idea being I can get a lot of my tools in there um and clothes and underwear and those other things. Yes. <laughs> those other non-essentials. Those don't go with the essential tool chest. <laughs> those are the the essential plus unlimited tool chest. Um, so you ship. This was interesting to me, and then you explained it, and it made total sense. You ship the tool chest out. I'm going to, yes. Empty. Yeah. This time I did not. Okay. Because I was a little bit late finishing it up. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, but you're going to ship the tool chest out empty yeah. and then fly with your tools. Yes. And that allows you to not be without your tools. That's which the is hardest a bummer. part. Yeah. yeah. You, you ship your tools like, you know, a week and a half ahead of time and you're stuck without your favorite tools for that length. So, yes, that's my new plan. But the thing that I was like, well, Mike, you kind of sound like a crazy person. Why are you, why have the tool chest at all then? Yeah. And you said, 
Because that's my shop away from my shop. It is. That's my workstation. And it totally that's, made sense. Yes. Yeah. So, and that's, that's yeah, because I thought, okay, here's all this to hold all these tools. Well, wait, I can't ship this with the tools in it because they're going to bang around too much. And I thought, well, what good is this if I can't ship the tools? And I, I treated it like a separate tool, which mm -hmm. is, you know, a tool chest in and of itself is its own thing. Yeah. So, yeah, favorite tool. Cool. Hopefully. All right, let's take a break. There's still time to get tickets to the 22nd annual Working Wood in the 18th Century Conference to be held January 16th through 19th, 2020 at the Williamsburg Lodge in Williamsburg, Virginia. This year's topic is Down the Great Wagon Road, Furnishing the Southern Backcountry. This year, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation is offering a limited number of student scholarships to attend the conference. Through these scholarships, the foundation strives to inspire students who are passionate and committed to their goals as they learn from the 18th century traditions and techniques. Scholarship recipients receive a full paid registration to all activities, including lectures and special events, as well as lodging at the Colonial Williamsburg Hotel. The award does not include travel or participation in the optional tours or workshops. To find out more, donate to the scholarship fund, or apply for a scholarship to the Working Wood in the 18th Century Conference, please visit the conference website. Question number three from Matt. I love the look of Chris Gochner's sideboard in Fine Woodworking number 277 and have added it to the must-build list. I wonder if you had any tips for sourcing rift sawn white oak. Is it just a matter of getting with the widest possible flat sawn boards and gluing the outer portions in the panels? Would the rip and flip method of a thicker board be realistic for a piece this size? Yeah. Okay. Question four. Yeah. You can buy uh, oak um, holds as rifts on. You're probably going to spend a lot of money. Um, the one place I know of, I've gotten stock. Um, was Tallarico Hardwoods, and they advertise with us, and they're they're famous for charging a lot of money for their wood, but it's really good. And if you want, you know, whatever, sixteen boards from the same tree, old growth Scottish white oak. Oh, that's where you go in Taunton's buying the wood. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> um, they can. I would say. Because plain sawn oak, um, number one, it's available in much wider boards than quarter sawn oak is. And, you know, it's it's not unreasonable to see 12, 14-inch wide plus plain sawn white oak boards. And if you can get like the outer four or five inches is pretty rift sawn, just rip out the center. I wouldn't even flip. I would just rip out the center and then just boom, bring those together and glue mm -hmm. them up so then all the grain is roughly going in the same direction. You're getting pretty close to riffs on. Yeah, take a look at your boards. Um, a lot of times, you know, if the heart is off center, you can get six or eight inches of rift and then maybe nothing on the other half. Sometimes mm -hmm. the heart is right there. Um, just when you're looking through a big stack, try to find super wide boards and check out the end grain. It's going to give you an idea of what boards you may want to pull out without having to look at every single board. So 15 inches wide, the the case is 15 three quarters inches yeah. wide. You would you would be cool doing a three board glue up? Sure. If you have to. And you'd be able to get three boards. Yep. Or you'd be able to get riffs on sections that wide. Yep. I've done that with that kind of a Krenov style case. I made the case out of ash and I wanted super tight riffs on grain to even quarter sawn. I think that was a three board glue up mm -hmm. and that extra glue line was worth it in order to get the straight grain on those on that case side. So when, when he mentions the rip and flip method, I know uh, Matt Kenny uses that a lot. Oh, okay. So like you're taking a plane on eight quarter, yeah. ripping it, laying out an edge. Yeah. It is. You got a lot of boards glued up. It can be okay. Yeah. So you're looking at two inch wide boards yeah. as opposed to, so you're looking at eight two inch wide boards. Yeah. That can get a little stripy. Yeah. it it It's not, when I've done it, it isn't, exact grain match to where it disappears it just looks like it's very pleasant but it just looks like very pleasant stripes of wood mm -hmm. like it doesn't it doesn't look like a single contiguous board i think if you take the edges off of a four quarter board and glue it up it's closer to looking like one white board mm -hmm. as long as the grain is all fairly straight i've almost gotten to the point where i've been doing the ripping and flipping for drawer sites though like for 
So you're getting why? Because I I make my Kumiko blocks out of eight quarter ash, and I often have these little pieces <laughs> of eight quarter stock that I don't know what to do with, but I just kind of rip them thinner, glue them up, and then I have these perfectly quarter sawn uh, drawer sides, so they're super super stable, and it looks cool. You like getting into Becks for like, oh, my drawer sides are all quarter sawn. Yeah, and I never have, but that's always been in the back of my mind. Darn it, I should probably do that. <laughs> that's just kind of that next level. Of, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, I have regretted buying any stock that wasn't eight quarter now, but I guess if you're going to buy four quarter stock, buy really wide stock if you can. Okay, sure. I think it depends what you're using it yeah. for. Um. It's like uh, Lou Arian, Arian Lumber. I was talking to him, and I think I wanted to buy like one piece of eight quarter tiger maple, and then like resaw it to get my aprons and my top out of, and leave it for you know eight quarter for the legs. And he was kind of like, "Why don't you just buy four quarter stock for the thin stuff? Why are you <laughs> resawing eight quarter stock?" Um, which which kind of makes sense because. Especially a lot of kiln dried stuff. If you start to resaw a quarter and you start to get a lot of bowing and cupping, there's a lot of waste in doing that. Like you cannot resaw a quarter stock in half to get um two. I don't even think you're going to get two three quarter inch thick boards. No, out I don't. Of that. Yeah, I my issue has been lately. I have not wanted three quarter inch stock. Yeah, I've been leaning chunkier. Okay. And so, and the things that I've been needing to build flat piece wise, um, they're all like displays and stuff for my wife. Like you want, I've been wanting it to look substantial and, and so, you know, one inch thick stock. Yeah. So I need eight quarter stock to get that, um, or thin one inch stock. Or five quarter. Love five quarter. Uh, I don't know. For some reason... I had, I think I just got really, really spoiled. I had like this beautiful small stash of eight quarter ash mm. that I was just able to like big 12 foot pieces. And you're just like, oh, I can get that from there and that from yeah. there and that from there. And last night I went to do something. My wife needed another rack and I, I only had a piece of four quarter ash and it just drove me bonkers because I couldn't pick the piece I wanted. Right. The pieces I wanted weren't in that board. Now, granted, it just, it, it was the wrong board for what I needed to. Right. It was just a board in my stash. But if it was eight quarter, I would have been able to get what I needed out of it. So. Yeah. That is a nice luxury. Yeah. And to answer Lou Arian's question, why would you want to do that? It's like I do a class, make a table from a board, so you start yeah. with eight quarter. And the idea is, well, because I can get all of the wood from one board. Yeah. So I have Lou Arian, talk to my Arian, Arian Lumber, and he supplies the cherry, eight quarter cherry for my classes where we do a table from a board. I just might not tell Lou that I'm like resawing all that up into <laughs> skittier stuff. <laughs> Cherry's super cheap well, right and, now. And I mean... A table from two boards just doesn't have the ring to it. No, yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. yeah, sideboard from 37 boards. <laughs> cherry's, cherry's been cheap lately? Super, super cheap. Amazingly cheap. Like what? Um, It's like, I think like six bucks for eight quarter cherry, like wide, you know, 10 inch wide yeah. stuff. And, uh, Speaking of Louis and he was saying how just mark has changed. And he was saying that, you know, that cherry boards, cherry logs that he would never even be able to bid on because they were just getting shipped out of the country. Mm -hmm. Now he's able to get, and not only that, they're like not horrendously expensive. And this was a couple years back. So um, it just still seems to be, you know, you go to a lumber yard. How much is that? Oh, you know, a quarter plain sawn oak. How expensive could that be? $9 a board foot. It's like, What? Or eight quarter ash, three and change. Yeah. What happened there? I know. And then don't even price walnut. That's like uh, crazy yeah. right now. Yeah. Yep. <sighs> All right. Let's see. So question number four is from David. When I'm ripping on my table saw, I use an English style fence. 
Huh. I was going to make some weird English joke. <laughs> is, is that like biscuits and cookies or something? And I, whatever. That was, I couldn't come up with anything good. Uh, obviously. Which is nothing more than a, an auxiliary board that I mount on my fence with T-bolts. And it ends at the center of the blade. Hmm. So it's a board that runs along the thickness of the fence, ending at the center of the blade. Sorry. Does this virtually, uh, doing this virtually eliminates kickback because after your workpiece is cut, it cannot be pinched between the fence and the back of the blade. Most of my woodworking buddies have never heard of this, and I've never seen it in photos within articles in fine woodworking. This seems to me to be something that would be standard in most shops. Is there some reason that most woodworkers in North America don't use this system? Is there a loss of accuracy or a safety issue that I'm not aware of? If so, I'd like to know so that I can stop doing it. If not, then I'd like to hear your guesses as to why this isn't more widely used. Well, I don't think it's an all or nothing proposition in that it's either everyone has to do this or nobody should do this. I think the nature of woodworking is you find something that works for you. Yeah. Um, I personally like the um, the long fence to the outfeed side of the blade because I find that I can control the stock against the fence without it tilting away. I think what I would worry about is I'm feeding stock and the fence stopped at the center of the blade. With nothing supporting that outfeed part of the stock, um, I think I would run the risk of that tilting toward that empty space and having the tail end of the board tilting out into the blade. That's yeah, so that's the only spot that's that if when I visualize making yeah. a cut like that, that last three inches of stock, yeah. you have very little reference. Yeah. yeah that the, board is that pivot point starts to get really short. Yeah. Yeah. Now granted, it's not gonna kick back, it's just gonna be a really off cut, but Yeah. And I, I think let's understand kickback a little bit yeah. um, and why it happens and, and what it is. So if you're ripping, say, you know, wide, six-inch wide board down the center, chances are if it's kiln-dried stock, those that kerf tends to want to pinch closed, and it does mm -hmm. want to pinch toward the back of the blade. It happens because of the stresses in the board you're releasing as you're making the cut. It has nothing to do with the fence being adjacent to that. Yeah. So basically what happens is that stock is actually coming away from the fence at the outside as it's pinching that kerf closed. Uh, yeah, that's super dangerous, which is kind of why I tend to never do that. I tend to like to break down everything, you know, roughly on the bandsaw so that I tend to treat my table saw as sort of a final dimensioning tool mm -hmm. as opposed to like a, you know, as a rough milling tool. So um so rather than ripping a six-inch six wide board in half, because that's just going to cup anyway, do that on the bandsaw, you know, joint that edge nice and flush, and then skinny up that extra, say you're you're just ripping it a quarter inch wide at the table saw, at the bandsaw, and you're just, now once you get it straightened, you're over at the table saw, and you're just cleaning up an eighth of an inch off of there. It's a super controlled cut. The stock is not going to warp or move, and it's super safe. Yeah, I... I feel like the aspect of kickback that that really concerns me is the pinching at the back of the blade. Yeah. And nothing is going to uh, replace a riving knife or a, a good splitter system or whatever Yeah, in that event. Um, yeah, I think work practices is, is certainly going to help. And then like you said, having a riving knife or splitter behind the blade just to keep the stock from coming in contact with those teeth as they're coming up out of the table, that's going to – that's that's what you want to be doing. Yeah. Now that said, in Europe, this is law that you can move the rip fence back to the point where it is stopping at the at the arbor, if you will. Um, it's fine. It's like I imagine if that's the way the school was set up when I was learning woodworking and yeah. I was comfortable with it and it's just what you do, that's fine. It's this kind of same thing. I think if you grow up or you learn 
all of your table saw methods with a guard in place. That's super safe. But yeah. because I don't, when I do have a guard in place, I'm having to rethink. My attention is else, elsewhere. So for me personally, a blade guard on a table saw is more dangerous than not having one just because of what I'm used to. So, you know, I would say, David, if this works for you, obviously there's a tradition for this working. I think that's fine. Um, I don't see a need to start to introduce. I wouldn't introduce it in my woodworking. I wouldn't teach people to do it just because I'm not comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. So I would say both. If it works for you and it's safe, do it. Yeah. And just the fact that other people aren't, I mean, for me, and I think for you, doing it, would personally represent a less safe situation for me. So having the continuous rip fence is actually safer for me and for you, it's safer to do the other one. That's all cool. Yeah. Talking about that, what you learned, my son cannot ride his bicycle without a helmet. He just like, even if it's like 20 feet, yeah. just, I, I, I have to put my helmet on. I said, you could ride it like 20 feet without putting your, don't go nuts or something. He's like, no, I don't feel safe. <laughs> There you go. And it's like, yeah. I have to force myself to wear a helmet when riding a bike because it's it's a good example to set. Yes. You know? So. All right. So we've got some listener comments or a listener comment um, along with a five-star review on iTunes. And that helps us get in the feed of other people, like-minded, woodworking type people. So thank you for those five-star comments and reviews. Uh, this one is from El Flora. And I really like this one. I've had a project sitting on my bench for a few months that I haven't worked on because I get frustrated by how little progress I make when I do. After listening to the latest podcast, I've realized that I idolize making something with all hand tools when I think I'll enjoy woodworking more when using some hand tools. Also, the reminders that it doesn't have to be perfect is great as well. This motivated me to get back out there on my project this past weekend, and I had a great time. Keep up the great pod. That's awesome. That like, yeah, that's like the whole point of it right there. Yeah. And I, I had a realization last night that um, I've gotten to the point where I'm so comfortable making mistakes that I almost enjoy them. Huh. Because I sit there and go, ah, oh, I'll never do that again. Huh. And I look at it as like this list of things that I've done and I don't need to worry about anymore. Or like that one's now in the book. And I've taken great pleasure in making mistakes. Not huh. always right in the moment, but. I think a certain consistency is good. I mean, you have a certain, I don't know, like you work within a certain tolerance. Yeah. And I think as long as you're consistent and your processes keep you within those tolerances, whatever they may be. Yeah. Awesome. Go <laughs> go make some stuff. All right. Um, do you have any recommendations? Uh, no. I thought about coming up with one, and then I got back to work. Huh. Yeah. I was trying to think of one, then I got distracted by that handle question. I, I, I'm I always leaning towards Instagram and podcast. Uh, the new uh, season of Startup is fantastic. Mm. So check that out. Uh, Instagram feed by Michael Cullen, fantastic woodworker, one of my yes. idols for years. Um, his Instagram feed is, it's a fun combination of the work that he does, his cats in his shop, and like this amazing food that he makes. And to me, it's just like this really nice, honest portrait into sort of, you know, I think it's the idea of what Instagram can do, which can just be open an authentic window and just, you know, a maker's life, both in what they make, how they make it, and what they eat, I guess. His, and his his perspective is always interesting to me because, like, he can just look at a thing lying over there and be like, "Oh, look at that cool shape." Yeah. And I'm I'm like, "No, that's a pile of magazines." And I'd be like, "Yeah, but look at those two where they meet. It's a cool shape. Let's make a box." He does and, live and in Northern <laughs> California, so there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, that's all for this episode of Shop Talk Live. If you have questions you'd like us to answer on the show, send them into shoptalkatalk.com. If you're watching on YouTube, click that thumbs up button. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Thanks for listening.
There's always a clock. Oh, really? That doesn't drive you nuts? Just now. Drives me nuts. <laughs> it's too quiet in here. Yeah. It's a nice reminder that your life is slowly ticking away. Dang, Mike. That last <laughs> <laughs> that last click of a second, you ain't getting that back. What were you doing? How'd you use it? And this is going to go on the outro, and so the listeners are going to be like, that last hour I spent listening to that podcast? Can't get it back, my friend. <laughs> <laughs>